let me kick off by saying I'm Michael Goldberg. I'm our executive director for the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here at Case Western Reserve. I see sitting on the top floor of ThinkBox where offices are. Um, I'm also a professor um, at the Weatherhead School of Management where I teach courses on entrepreneurship and we're thrilled um, to have Norm here today as part of our uh, CWRU Entrepreneurship Alumni Speaker Series. Uh, Nathan Romig, who's a freshman student, is going to be uh, from his dorm room, moderating today's discussion. And Nathan, thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate it. Um, for those that are on Zoom um, and you want to ask a question, we hope to make these super interactive. So just let Nathan know if you have a question that you want to ask Norm and um, he'll either call on you to unmute and ask it yourself or he can ask it for you. And if you're on LinkedIn Live, just put a question in the comments and then Doug and I will be monitoring and uh, we'll make sure we feed those questions to Nathan. So let me send it over to you, Nathan. And I would just say, well, first of all, before Nathan gets going, thank you guys all for having me. I, as you will see, I'm sure over the course of this uh, chat, I have a wonderful uh, warm spot in my heart for Case Western Reserve and, and how it has served me in life. Um, and so it's nice to be virtually back. I do hear um, that the place looks very different from when I was there, but, um, but there we go. And then the other thing I would say to whoever else is listening or looking in or whatever, uh, to Michael's point, uh, the more questions, the better, so that hopefully I can just try to address what people want to hear about as opposed to me sort of rambling on about, you know, whatever. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Romig. I'm a first year undecided engineering major, and today I'll be moderating our conversation with Mr. Norman Alajem. Uh, Norman is a 1978 graduate of Case Western, who is now the CEO of Mainstay Entertainment. Uh, before Mainstay, uh, Norman held leading positions to multiple companies in the entertainment industry, uh, including Levity entertainment group and writers and artist agency. Uh, throughout his career, he's also pursued many creative endeavors, including producing movies and TV shows, as well as writing his own book. Um, and uh, before I forget, please, everyone, uh, feel free, uh, like Mr. Goldberg said, to either put your questions in the chat or um, yeah, also indicate through the chat that you'd like to directly ask your question. Um, It'd be great to hear from everyone. That's all I have to say for now. Um, Norman, I'll give you the floor back uh, to go through your background and uh, get our conversation started. Uh, thank you, Nathan. I I'm gonna try to make my background, uh, so to speak, short so we can get to, to the questions. But I will say, and by the way, just so that I understand, is, is, is this an entrepreneurial group? Who's actually listening in on this? Is it students? Is it just alumni? Who, who's, who, who are we talking with here? Sure. I, no, I'll chime in. And, and um, in, in the world of social media and LinkedIn live streaming, sometimes the answer is we're never quite sure. So we do yeah. have a great um, partnership with our alumni association that promotes. It. So we'll have a number of folks that are watching on LinkedIn live that are part that are alums. Um, we tend to have students and then just folks. So it's entrepreneurship as a broad theme. Um, We've covered many different industries and topics, so that tends to be what hooks people in, sort of learning the entrepreneurial story. But um, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of flexibilities directionally, and frankly, we're never quite sure. As we say hi to all of our friends on LinkedIn Live who have joined us, who's who's joining us, but it, it's usually a mix of student alums with entrepreneurship, broadly speaking, as an interest. But thanks for the question. So here, here's a little bit about my background. And interestingly enough, and Nathan and I were talking about this a little before, uh, I will say that I owe my entire career in the entertainment industry um, to two things. The game of baseball, which I'll explain in a second, and Louis Gianetti, who was my introduction to film professor when I was at Case Western Reserve. And I don't know if... if uh, Mr. Giannetti is, is still around or even yep. still alive. He lives around um, the corner from me. He's great. Oh, uh, well, please tell him hello for me. Hopefully he will remember me. Um, oh, but, but the reason, yeah, hopefully he'll remember me 40 years later from all the thousands of students he's had. 
Um, but here's, here is how I started in life. The reason I talk about baseball and Louis Giannetti is this. I grew up, we are immigrants to this country. My family came to the U.S. when I was eight years old. Um, I didn't speak a word of English. We moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and I wanted what most eight-year-old immigrant boys want at that time, which is simply to assimilate into the, into the culture and just be accepted. I will say that by the time I enrolled at Case Western Reserve University at the age of 18 or whatever, I don't think I had seen more than one or two films in my entire life. I don't think I had seen that. We, we used to watch All in the Family because my father loved it. But beyond that, I don't think we watched much television. It just was not in our zeitgeist. Our immigrant culture was, you know, wheel to the, you know, shoulder to the stone, assimilate, study, do well. The arts were not anything that was in our bailiwick. But I had played baseball in college, and I played baseball at Case Western Reserve University. And as some of you may know, and I hear that actually Case now has a pretty good baseball team, but um, in college, at least when I was there, during the season, everybody would say, oh, take the easy courses. We used to call them gut courses, at least when I was there. Take the easy courses uh, because you're going to be practicing with the team. You're going to be on the road to Allegheny or whatever it is. Um, and somebody said to me, I think it was my junior year, somebody said, uh, I was looking for my, quote, easy baseball season uh, course. And somebody said, you should take this course taught by Louis Gennetti called Introduction to Film. And all you really do is you watch movies in the class and then you write a term paper in the end. And I thought, well, I can certainly do that. And, I, and I'll play baseball and, and whatever. But having no sense of what film was, what the industry, certainly what the entertainment industry was, that there was an entertainment industry. And I started taking the course and Mr. Giannetti changed my life because, and, and at the time he had written, and I don't know if it's still around, he had written the seminal book, I think it was called Introduction to Film. And he just analyzed films and he talked about Hollywood and all that stuff. And I remember for the first time in my life thinking, I can get out my stories, I can inspire my emotions and visions through film. I remember um, he showed us a film called The Pumpkin Eater. And there's a scene in The Pump Pumpkin Eater, it's a very famous old movie. There's a scene in The Pumpkin Eater where, uh, I can't remember the, woman, the actress's name, but she is framed in a windowsill. And Giannetti was explaining to us how the director was using the composition of the windowsill and the woman in it to show how she was trapped in her marriage and her life and whatever. And I was just blown away by all that. Um, loved the class, loved Gianetti. And then after my junior year of college, I decided I want to see what this Hollywood stuff is all about. And I decided I was going to go spend the summer in, in LA. Talk about entrepreneurial visions and desires. And so I went to my father and I said, look, lend me some money. I want to go spend the summer in L.A. finding out about the entertainment industry. And my father, again, immigrant doctor, you know, straight ahead says, well, what are you going to do in L.A.? And I said, I don't know. If I have to, I'll just go and work at a gas station, pump gas, whatever, and look around and see what it's about. And my father said, well, if you're going to pump gas, you might as well stay in Cleveland. And I said, no, if I'm pumping gas, I'm going to Hollywood. And to, his, to my father's credit, he get, at the time, I don't know if they still do this, but at the time, Greyhound Bus Lines did a thing where for $99, you could travel anywhere you wanted in the country as much as you wanted for 90 days. And so my father gave me $99 and said, here's your transportation. You're on your own beyond that. I took $99 and I bought a red-eye one-way ticket to on a plane to L.A., and came, and came to LA, and funny enough, I did actually work at a gas station, weirdly enough, uh, for part of that summer. But what I did was, I, and this is of course pre-9-11, so things were much easier, but I used to sneak into all the studios, and I used to you know, go and wait in line for the Tonight Show, and I, I just started to absorb myself in not only what was entertainment, but what was the entertain what did the entertainment industry mean? And I will never forget, I tell the story because I do a lot of public speaking and I tell the story of, I remember once I was going into, M, I was trying to go into MGM and I snuck in and again, pre 9-11, I don't think you could do that today. 
but I snuck in and those, this was also in the days where you had the actual film cellulite. So they had these film reels before digital, before any of that stuff. And in a trash can in the studio, I found one of those big empty cans, canisters. And so I took it and I took it with me. And the next day, which I think was a Saturday, I came back to MGM or I went to Paramount or somewhere with a thing under my arm, like I knew what I was doing and there was nobody there. And as I'm walking past the guard gate, the guard gate looks at me and he goes, hey, you. And I go, yeah. He goes, I see you have that canister. Are you going to editing? I'm like, yes, I am. He goes, okay, go ahead in. Um, so I spent the summer doing that sort of thing. And I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with Hollywood and storytelling and all those sorts of things. My parents, of course, thought I was crazy. Uh, I came back. I did my senior year. Um, and then I knew I wanted to go to California, but again, as an immigrant kid, you don't just go out to California to be in the entertainment business. So I started applying to law schools and, um, and again, th it, this is a little entrepreneurial norm. Uh, I had gotten into a couple of law schools on the East coast. Um, and my parents kept saying, you know, where are you going? Where are you going? And I kept saying, I haven't heard from anybody yet because I was waiting to see, what West Coast school would admit me. I ended up going to law school at UCLA, graduating from UCLA. Um, I practiced law. I was an entertainment lawyer for about seven years. Um, I loved it, but I started feeling, and I will say now, it, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm glad I practiced law. And today as a producer and talent management uh, manager, it really helps me in my day-to-day -day travel. But at the time I thought, my God, the, the law is boring. I don't really want to do this. I left the law business after about seven years to produce a film that I had co-written called Firewalker, which starred Lou Gossett Jr. and uh, Chuck Norris at the time. Um, and then I've just been, so I just started bouncing around the entertainment industry. I was an independent producer for a while. That's very hard going. You know, it's, what, what I will say about the, the entrepreneurial spirit, which I definitely have, and hopefully a number of you have, is you have to be prepared for great highs and great lows, right? The twin engines of the entrepreneurial life and the entrepreneurial spirit is you're going to fail a lot. But as I always like to say, being a baseball buff, if you bat 333 in baseball, you're in the Hall of Fame, and that's still a two-thirds failure rate. So you just have to keep moving forward to, to what you love. Um, I was a producer for a while, you know, limited success. Um, and then I became an agent. I was an agent for about 20 years. Um, I started this boutique literary agency called Writers and Artists Agency. I ended up becoming the uh, chairman and CEO of that company. I then sold the company to, Parad to the Paradigm Agency. And again, entrepreneurial spirit. My goal was, if you're an entrepreneur and if you work for yourself, the trick is every so often it takes some money off the table because you're going to have lead times and you want to put some money in the bank. So my goal when I sold Writers and Artists to Paradigm was I was going to, it was the most counterintuitive negotiation ever. If you know anything about mergers and acquisitions in business, the acquired CEO always wants to make the longest deal possible because you know that in six months you're going to be out. And so you have a golden parachute. In this instance, I was trying to do the opposite. I was trying to get somebody to write me a check, do a deal for one year to turn over the company in the right way, and then leave. And the CEO of the company that acquired us um, didn't want to do that because I controlled a lot of the business, this and that. So he wanted to get a five-year deal. I tried to do a one-year deal. <clears throat> we settled on a three-year deal, and then I ended up staying at that company uh, and running it for about nine years. Um, I would say about 10 years ago, I left to run this company called Levity Entertainment that Nathan was talking about, which was management and production and digital, which is a division that at the time was losing them a lot of money. And then that company owned and uh, operated a number of comedy clubs. And about four years ago, I left there and I started my own company called Mainstay Entertainment, um, which I'm the CEO of, as, as Nathan also said. And we are a management and production company. We do talent management. We represent actors, writers, directors, uh, TV creators, whatever, and then film and television production. And we have a number of films that we've done, a number of TV series that we're doing. And um, pandemic notwithstanding, we're still here. So that's, that's the short-ish version 
of how I got from Luis Giannetti's introduction to film class to talking on this webinar today. Okay, thank you. By the uh, way, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Nathan. I do want to tell there's a coda to the Luis Giannetti story, which I love. There's a, there is a uh, senior executive at Sony Pictures named Ange Giannetti. And back in my agent days, I'm going back now probably 20 years, I was having lunch with her and you're talking about business and this and that and the other. And I said to her, by the way, Giannetti is a very unique name and I owe my entire career to a guy named Louis Giannetti, Louis Giannetti, who was my teacher when I was in college. And Anj goes, yeah, that's my uncle. So there you go. Wow. Um, okay, so my, my first question for you is, um, so what, what motivated you to um, like leave the companies that you left and then start anew? That's a fantastic question. And I, I do think it goes a little bit to, there's a few answers to it. Number one, I do have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, that's the positive way to say it. The negative way to say it is I have a, the attention span of a gnat. Um, so I'm always looking for new experiences. I've always, I'm always looking for new and different things that I can do in life. And in, in a weird way, um, I think if I'm just, you know, steady as she goes, um, I feel like, okay, well, I've got to move on and do something else. I remember when I was a kid and again, I grew up with an, in a, I, I do not minimize the impact of, of anyone's childhood on, on their lives, but certainly my childhood as an, immig and as an immigrant kid and a family just trying to make it um, and put food on the table and all that kind of stuff. And I think in my family, we experienced a lot of security is the great substitute for happiness. And so I think somewhere in the back of my head, I'm sure a therapist would have a lot to say about this, but I, I think somewhere in the back of my head, I always thought, well, if security is a substitute for happiness and I want to be happy, then I can't be secure. And so I think that for a long time in my life, I would start thinking, well, if I'm feeling secure, I'm making money, I'm on a path, then that, must, that can only lead to unhappiness. And so I have to go and do something else. And it's only in my you know, later years that I've realized that you can be both happy in your life and in your job and also not, not necessarily eating hand to mouth every day. So I think that's a little bit of it. Um, I think the other part is, you know, my mother used to always say that life was like roller skating, partly where you want to go and partly where the damn things take you. And sometimes I would be in a, I'll give you a perfect example. I left the agency business, not because I was tired of being an agent or because I wasn't succeeding or any of those things, but very simply because this company Levity came to me and said, this is what we do. We thrive in the comedy clubs. We have a management division. We produce, blah, blah, blah. But none of us really knows how to run a company. And what we really want to be is a multimedia, vertically integrated company. You've run companies. Will you come run this company? And it just sort of presented itself. And I thought to myself, ah, let's see what happens. And so I went. Hopefully now with my own company, um, you know, now, I mean, you don't have to be a, a math genius to know that if I graduate in 78, I'm not as young as I used to be. Hopefully, my, this company will be how I ride off into the sunset. <laughs> but, but you never know. I may give this talk again in two years and be doing something completely different. Very good. Very good. Um, now one of my clients, I'm sorry, one other thing I will say, one of my clients is a fellow named Trevor Noah, who is the host of The Daily Show, and he is from South Africa. And he's really, in addition to being very funny and all those things, he's really one of the most interesting, thoughtful, you know, gracious human beings you'll ever meet. And I often say to him, you should go run for prime minister in South Africa, and I'll run your campaign. So maybe that's what I'll do next. <laughs> so I'm, I'm also curious, because you've mentioned uh, your entrepreneurial spirit a few times. So have you, have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur then? Or is that something that you would attribute to 
that like saying about security and happiness or you know, what motivated uh, your entrepreneurial spirit? That's a, another wonderful question. I don't know the answer to it. I would say if anything, because of my upbringing, the last thing I ever wanted to do was be an entrepreneurial and experience the highs and lows of, of that. I think if, if anything, what, what had been hardwired into my brain was, you know, if you don't like the sight of blood, then go to law school instead of medical school. Um, and then be a lawyer and, you know, raise a family and, and ride off into the sunset. But something in me didn't want to do that. And so I just kept, no matter how hard I tried, I kept getting drawn back into, I wanted to have experiences in life. You know, there's a motivational speaker who I love named Les Brown and in one of his talks, I see somebody down there laughing. Maybe they know Les Brown's work. Uh, in, one of, in one of his uh, talks, Les Brown says, for m too many of us, our gravestones could easily read dead, but not used up. The goal is to be used up. And so I've always taken that to heart. I've always believed in that. Um, and I've always just, I've always, I never have chased money to tell you the truth. Sometimes to my detriment, I have always chased life experiences. And funny enough, if you, if you think about my career and some of the ups and downs that I've had, I would say that some of my lowest times, uh, as I look back, I think were some of the best times in my life. I always remember and Nathan talked about a book that I wrote. And the book that I wrote, which has nothing to do, and I don't want, I don't want to derail into it, but you can buy it on Amazon. Um, I, <laughs> um, the book is, it's not a book about the entertainment business or anything like that. It's actually a series of essays that I wrote to my daughter, when, my youngest daughter, when she was about 10 or 11 years old. And one of the uh, essays that I wrote her, one of the, they're presented as letters to her. And one of the letters that I wrote to her is on the importance of failure and how, fa not that you should be comfortable with failure, you shouldn't be, I, I loathe failure, but I understand that the possibility of failure is the key to success. As I was saying earlier, right? If you bat 300 in baseball, you're a superstar, it's a 70% failure rate. One of the, uh, I tell the story, um, in my chapter about failure of a time in my career, I had been chasing experiences. You know, I was single at the time. I didn't have a wife or children or any of that stuff. Um, and I had gone through every nickel I owned. I was living as if every dollar I made, I could spend 10. I was crazy, crazy, six figures probably into consumer debt. And I decided, okay, I gotta get a job. And I started trying to find a job nobody would hire me. And I mean, nobody would hire me um, either because, you know, they thought I was too old to start over or because they thought correctly that I was just looking for a safe harbor in a storm and then would leave once I had some money back in my pocket or, or whatever, for whatever reasons. But I remember very vividly, and if any of you have been to LA, there's a place called Venice Beach, which is a fantastic, beach. first of all, it's a beautiful beach. And there's all sorts of crazy people there, weightlifting and smoking dope and or, or everything you could imagine is at Venice Beach. And I have this very clear memory. One day I had gotten my hundredth rejection letter from who knows where. And um, I was out of money. I was out of, um, I was out of credit card. I was out of everything. I'd gone to the ATM to get $20. I couldn't find them. And um I remember running down the beach, bawling. I mean, literally tears, ball, you know, coming down my cheeks, thinking I have ruined my life. I will never get another job. I will never be able to support a family if I'm, and by the way, I won't be able to get a family because no one wants to be with a failure. Um, and it's funny because I, in hindsight, I think about, you know, running down the beach as a, whatever I was at the time, 35, 37, um, you know, bawling like a baby either people were looking at me like I was crazy or it being Venice beach, nobody gave me a second look, you know? Um, but again, as I was saying, those are sort of the twin engines of the entrepreneurial life and you have to be ready for it. And after my 
300th rejection. I was hired um, by this little, I didn't want to go back to the law business, although I certainly would have if I had had to, at least I had that to fall back on. Um, and then I got hired by writers and artists and, you know, started the long climb back. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I ever set out to be an entrepreneur, but I will say it has been an incredibly worthwhile, exciting life. And to Les Brown, hopefully my grave will say dead and used up. Awesome. Awesome. So right now, uh, Mr. Goldberg is telling me that Lou is on the call. Um, Lou, if you'd like to unmute, that would be awesome. They're working on unmuting. They're not the most technically adept. Uh, okay. so, Here we go. Issues. We're two dinosaurs. Nat, Norman, can you speak? <laughs> I can hear you. I can see you. I'm excited. I haven't seen you in what, 40 years, 30 years? 40 years, 40 years. I was, you missed it. I was telling everybody that I owe my entire career to you. That's very generous. My, my niece, uh, uh, Andrea Giannetti, also told me the same thing, that she had lunch with you and you were raving about me. I should hire that you is... as my agent. <laughs> well, I, I've done that plenty. I can do it. I can do it. But yeah, it, was actually, it was actually funny, and I did tell the story before you jumped on, that I was having lunch with Anj. This is probably 20 years ago. Um, you know, I was an agent at the time. She was at Sony, still is at Sony. Yes. And, um, and I said, you have such an unusual last name. I owe my career to a fellow named Louis Gianetti. And she goes, <laughs> yeah, that's my uncle. <laughs> Small world, yes. So it's so, so nice to see you, and, I, and I'm so happy to be able to thank you. Oh, man, you thanked me a dozen times. Uh, what are you doing now? You say you were an agent? I, I thought you were a lawyer. I was, <laughs> I was a, you should have come in at the beginning, Lou. I, know. I was a, I was a lawyer, then I was an agent, and now I run a talent management and film and TV production company. Very good, very good. Are you prospering? So far, so good. Yeah, so even far, so during good, the COVID? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? Even during COVID? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's been, look, it's, it's, these are challenging times because they're now everybody is trying to reboot. There's yeah. very little uh, film or TV production back up so far. Uh, yes. Um, so that's challenging, but we've been fortunate. We haven't had to lay anybody off or any of those things. So I count myself, I count myself blessed. I just wish it would all move back to, to where it was. But all things considered, I could not be doing better. Very good. I'm proud of you. And, and I am thankful beyond words. <laughs> Thank you. So nice well, to see you. Please, please tell Anj that uh, we got to reconnect. I will. I will. I never, I never knew her name was Anj until she sent me an email. And I thought, what the hell is this Anj? And she said, that's what everybody calls her because they can't pronounce her last name, apparently. That's so funny. I, <laughs> Well, Are you I, well? Yes, I'm pretty good for an old guy. I'm not doing badly. Uh, unlike you, I've lost all my hair. But except for that, uh, I'm holding together pretty well. Well, I will tell you, and then we'll get back to the questions and answers from Nathan. But um, I will tell you, other than the fact that you're not wearing that little black hat you always wore, you yeah. look exactly the same. Well, I thank you, sir. That was a very sweet lie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll let you get back to business now, but it was good seeing you again. I'm glad to hear you're doing so well. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Back at you. Great to see you. Yes. Bye-bye. Are you guys back on? Yeah. Yeah. Nathan, all you. Yeah. Great to hear. Great to hear from Lou. Um, okay. So, um, so with so many different um, pursuits in your life. Uh, is there any that you look back on um, as being like, like your favorite, I guess, like any, any that really stand out to you? I'm sorry. Can I answer that question in one second? Lou, are you still on? Oh, he may have. Oh, they are. Can you hear so, me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. I'm sorry. Just okay. one other question. Um, since I just feel so blessed to see you, are yes. you still are you still um, 
doing the introduction to film book? Are you still updating it? It's currently in its 14th edition. You probably wouldn't even recognize it now. Wow. And believe wow. it or not, it's a big hit in China. I'm not quite sure why, but it, uh, I've sold over several hundred thousand copies in China alone. So it's still either number one or number two in its, uh, in its class. So I've been very lucky, very lucky. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Nathan. I'm, I'm, back to, I'm back to you now. I'm off okay. of Lou and I'm back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I <laughs> stand by Lou for further questions from Norma. Okay, 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 I'll say on. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was just curious, um, is there any uh, pursuit that you found uh, that you, I guess you have the most uh, good memories with? Like what, what, what has been your favorite pursuit so far? Of all the different things that I've done? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think it falls into two categories that goes into the two things that I tend to do for a living, both as a manager and as a producer. Um, as a producer, I will say I love producing because I don't have the, putting the book aside that I wrote, I don't really, I'm not a writer, I'm not an actor, I'm not a performer, I can't direct anything. That's not my gift. But as a producer, to be able to put projects together um, to tell stories as a series, TV series or, a, or as a film, um, that's very, very fulfilling. And I really enjoy that. I enjoy being on set. I, I'm good at problem solving. So, you know, a generator goes down or an actor won't come out of their trailer or whatever. Um, I find fulfillment in situations that others might find madness. So I enjoy that. The other thing that I enjoy, and it goes very much to my career as a talent representative, is a, a, a corollary, corollary of the same thing, which is I find that most artists have a certain unique view of the world, right? For those of us who are more on the business side of things, what we tend to do is say, okay, let's look at the playing field, let's figure out you know, do we go left? Do we go right? Do we go over? Do we go under? Let's just figure that out. Most artists aren't that way. They have a creative vision and then they just go. And if they hit a wall and they hit a wall and they hit a wall and they hit a wall, that's what they know what to do because their eyes on the prize of their creative vision. So for me in representing talent, to be able to, to take uh, talented people, whether they're creators or actors or comedians or directors, and help them navigate the craziness that is the entertainment industry, which is very different than the art of entertainment. Um, that's, that's very fulfilling. I always used to say back in my agent days, I always used to say, you know, there's a lot of nobility in being an agent and people would laugh at me. And they would say, nobility and being an agent are not two words that you usually hear used together. But I think if I can take somebody who can create a wonderful story in any way, what, through their voice, through their writing, through their acting, whatever, um, and help those stories see the light of day and help them make a living doing that, I think that's nobility, you know? So I do enjoy representing talent very much. It sometimes, uh, you know, it sometimes makes you pull out your hair, but it is incredibly fulfilling. And I also find now in my older age that I do love producing. I love watching the process uh, of idea to screen and being a part of moving that forward. Excellent, excellent answer. Um, so it looks like, um Donna Luisa might have something to say. Um, would you like to unmute Donna? Hi, Donna. Hi, Hi folks. How, How are you? Guys. So that um, I have a quick one. We have a bit of a storm going on. So if I get cut off. Huh? Donna, you're in Trinidad. You're in Trinidad right now, Donna? Yes, I am. I'm in Trinidad. Oh. And the rain is like horrible. It's more like a storm at the very moment. Um, so, so far I'm we Don hear you perfectly. All right, I'm Donna Luisa, obviously, and I'm an entrepreneur, um, business developer, um, consultant. And one of the things that I found quite interesting, I love Les Brown. He's one of those people that inspires me over and over. But what I would like to ask 
is the, pe the people that you manage. Have you found, have you been able to, how do you motivate them to, when things don't go as they, as they would like? How do you inspire them to continue? And do you get an opportunity to encourage them to develop an entrepreneurial aspect of themselves or they have to, to have a business that um, could help sustain them in the lows? Because like with um, talent management, I mean, you know, you know from what you've said about the ups and the downs. So you want to keep them focused. How do you do it? Um, that's a fantastic question. And first of all, anyone who is an artist has signed up for the entrepreneurial life, right? What I always say is, if you want to be a doctor, here's the path. College, medical school, residency, you're a doctor. If you want to be a lawyer, college, law school, bar exam, you're a lawyer. If you want to be an artist of any kind, here's the path. The path is, it's Joseph Campbell. The path is, go to the deepest, darkest part of the forest, walk in, and, you know, proceed with the hero's journey. Um, I would say it is very, very challenging when an artist is having a down period. Uh, because the challenge is to, as you say, Donna, to keep them inspired to keep them moving forward, but to also manage the expectation that you're gonna have ups and you're gonna have downs. You know, when you, if you've picked an artistic life or an entrepreneurial life, you, and by the way, and even if you haven't, life is gonna have ups and life is gonna have downs. The one thing that remains constant is talent and drive and work ethic and commitment to excellence and integrity for the craft and all those, those are the things. And those are the things that I try to imbue my clients with or anybody, you know, who, who asks me for advice. I will say to the second part of your question, part of what I always try to do with any client is figure out multiple quarters of revenue for the lean times, right? And the notion is my, you know, my granny used to say, the trick is to figure out ways to make money while you're sleeping as opposed to just when you're working. Um, and so what I try to do with clients is figure out ways that they can make money. Certainly these days on social media, um, they can make money on if they, if at, at a certain modicum of success, you can do product lines, you can sell merchandise, you can write yourself out of director hell. If you're a director that has had a couple of bad movies, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to get past those lean times but I think one of the important things to understand when you're having lean times is, number one, let's figure out what the problem is in front of us and get out of it through doing the process correctly, right? Because in my experience, if you do the process correctly, you're going to have the right outcome more often than not. And by the way, if you do the process incorrectly, you're going to have the wrong outcome more often than not, unless you happen to win the lottery. So what's the problem in front of us? Is it a pandemic? that is causing you not to work? Is it the fact that you've made some bad choices? Is it the fact that you haven't listened to your uh, partners in the creative process? What has happened that is causing the downturn? And then let's figure out how to get past the downturn. And the other thing that is important for, again, artists, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and everybody on this Zoom, these things are temporary, right? It, it, failure is an event. It's not a state of being. Again, it goes back to being comfortable with the notion that it's, life is not perfect. You're not going to succeed 100% of the time. And if you can understand that you may be going through a rough patch, but we will get through it. If you have the work ethic and commitment to excellence and all those things to move forward, over time, you can sustain a successful career. And that's what I try to tell people. And by the way, tell myself when I'm down too. Okay. Um, now it looks like uh, Mr. Goldberg might also have a question to ask you. Great. I'm not answering um, anything from Mr. Goldberg. That's right. It's wise. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for doing this and that lose joining. I mean, and the, the 
the darkness that is this pandemic and COVID time, one of the amazing things that today is a great indication where being able to quickly, and thanks to Brian for contacting Lou and getting him to join. I'm so glad that was, that was the high we've been doing like 50 or 60 of these so far. And that reconnection was probably the highlight of our whole speaker series. So thank you, Lou. Well, for being in. That was awesome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lou. Truly. I cannot state more from my heart. What a thrill that part of this is. That was awesome. Um, you know, on the sort of power of networking, and it, it, I mean, one theme that I hear you discussing and how you work with clients and what you've done um, in your own career, and which I think applies to a lot of the talks that we've heard and, and for students and others that are joining is, you know, leveraging networks and, and reaching out and reaching beyond your comfort zone. You know, I'm sort of curious as you reflect on your own success in networking and also as you may be contacted from case students and people that reach out, like what are some pieces of advice you might have for particularly our students that are kind of looking to sort of build their networking skills, whether they're trying to get into entertainment or doing anything with their careers? Um, a fantastic question. It, certainly in the entertainment industry and, and to your point, probably in business and in life generally, um, I, I would say a few things. Number one, I attribute a lot of my success in life to my willingness to work outside my comfort zone. That is 100% a requirement if you're gonna uh, pick an entrepreneurial profession because being outside your comfort zone is how you move forward. And when you talk about things like networking, you know, in my industry, I was, I was an agent for almost 20 years and my job, and by the way, what I sort of, one of the things I loved most about being an agent other than I just love being involved with the arts is the notion is if I don't know Michael Goldberg, it is actually my job to call you and take you to lunch and get to know you and see what kind of projects you're working on and how we can work together. And do I have any clients that might make sense for what you're doing, depending on who you are in, in the industry or the world. Um, but it's, but you know, humans don't love rejection by and large. And if you're going to network, you just have to understand that not everybody is going to like you. Not everybody wants to work with you. Not everybody is going to say yes to whatever you want or need them to do. And you just have to be ironically comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I always, you know, I always used to say, and again, now I've been married for a long time, but I, I used to say when I was single, if I asked a woman out on a date and she said no, it's not really about me. She doesn't know me, right? So I shouldn't really take that personally. If she goes out with me on three, and four, three or four dates and then says no, yeah, that's about, she's, now she's really rejecting me, right? But in terms of the networking world, and by the way, specifically in the, in the, in the entertainment industry, that's what everybody, that's the, the commerce, the meritocracy of entertainment on the business side is actually networking, right? My clients expect me to be able to get the head of a studio on the phone or the head of a network or some producer or director. Uh, that's my job. And so my uh, currency is the ability to either get to know those people, be willing to make those calls to know those people, um, and, and, and figure out how to cultivate relationships with those people. The other thing I will say, and this is, and I'll tell a quick little side story. Um, th this is one of the very few uh, advantages to getting old. Most of my friends who are now running studios and networks or are big producers and directors, I've known since we were all, you know, 30 year old pitchers working in mail rooms and whatever we were doing. So it's not like, oh my God, I know the head of the studio. It's like, we've been drinking buddies for 30 years, right? So a lot of it is just, if you come up together, and I say this all the time to young executives and young agents and managers, whatever, who are anxious to reach up five steps above them. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I applaud it and encourage it. But the more effective and efficient way to do it is to become friends with your circle of uh, people, because that's the next generation of Vince Vaughn's and Adam Sandler's and Scott Rudin's and, you know, whoever those people are. 
Um, but I think the power of networking is the power of being willing to be outside your comfort zone, of not taking it personally if people don't call you back or, or whatever it is, and, and just plowing ahead. You know, in the entertainment industry, it's, it's a weird thing about phone calls because we spend so much of our day on, on phones. And I'll hear people say, oh, so-and-so isn't returning my call or this or that, the other. But people at the very top, I will tell you, return every single call by and large. It's sort of the middle management people who think they're being powerful by not returning somebody's call. That's not on you. That's just their, that's their problem. Um, but I think it's very important in whatever industry you're in, and certainly in entertainment, to look, up, look out over the playing field Take some, by the way, I do this as a talent representative all the, all the time. It's always nice to sign an actor or writer or whatever who already makes a lot of money, who already is very successful. But I will tell you some of my biggest successes as a representative have been people who I have identified very early on and helped them to architect their career. And although it's really fun to represent movie stars or whatever, I can tell you in my world and probably in most of life, there is nothing more gratifying, exciting, or fulfilling than the ride up, right? And I'll give you an example. Back in my agent days, I got a call. This is some years ago. And I got a call for, I was an agent, and I got a call from a manager saying, I represent this young guy. He did a, some movie, you know, some independent movie. I'm looking to find him an agent. Will you come to a screening of the film and, um, you know, and see if you'd be interested in representing this kid? I'm like, yeah. So we went to this little screening room and I'm, I'm watching the movie um, and I thought the guy was fine, but I will tell you, I could not take my eyes off of the female in the movie who was this 16 or 17 year old girl at the time named Katherine Heigl. I did not sign the guy and I can tell you, I don't even remember who it was, but I did actively pursue Katherine Heigl, you know, She's had an interesting career because there was a moment for, of about three or four years where um, she was one of the biggest female movie stars in the world, making $15, $17 million a movie. Um, but that ride up from, you know, 17-year-old whatever to you're riding around in private planes in France, that's a fantastic ride up. And the same thing I was talking earlier about my client, Trevor Noah, who's the host of The Daily Show. When I signed Trevor Noah, he wasn't the host of The Daily Show. He was some South African guy working, you know, comedy clubs in America. Nobody knew who he was, but I saw him perform at some club. And I was like, this guy is fantastic. He has a fresh voice. He has an interesting take, this, that, or the other. And, you know, I convinced him to work with me. A year later, he was the, the host of The Daily Show. And now he's a big star. And again, it's fun to represent him as a big star, but when he and I talk about the fun stuff we do together, we're always thinking about that right up. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's interesting. That's great. No, thank you. Okay, that was, that was awesome. Um, okay, unfortunately, it looks like that's all the time we have today. But uh, Norman, we really appreciate you talking with us all. Um, I know I, for one, learned a lot from you today. Um, okay, uh, I'll give uh, Mr. Goldberg back the floor uh, to finish our conversation today. Great. And, and Nathan, thank, thank you, Nathan. you so much for moderating. You may be our first freshman to moderate one of our sessions. So great job. Um, you really uh, held the floor well, and um, that was fun. And, and Norman, thank you for doing this. I mean, I've mentioned before, and, and I see that Lou's still on, that – interaction with a with a mentor and professor and someone that touched you on campus and then to actually have you guys get together here on zoom it really was one of the highlights of of any of our sessions so thank you um lou for for being able to join and, and norman for your time today that was that was awesome well i would say first of all thank you guys all for having me really fun secondly nathan you were amazing stepped outside your comfort zone beautifully um and lou uh, I don't even know what to say other than thank you for my great career in life. 